Vandaag spreken we met meneer Schöpflin en hij is van de Hongaarse partij van Viktor Orban. En dat is iemand die volgens Wilders helemaal begrepen heeft hoe het moet in Europa. Wilders zei recent op onze camera, hij zou graag Viktor Orban ruilen met Rutte. Ja, gisteren zou ik dat al willen. Een man die staat voor de nazistaat, een man die staat voor zijn eigen cultuur, voor zijn eigen religie, voor zijn eigen... Land die eh, nou, ongeveer een alles het tegenovergestelde is dan de grote geboren cultuurrelativisten, de volksopheffer, de Nederland verkoper Mark Rutte. Mr. Schöpflin, our Dutch member of parliament, Geert Wilders, you're familiar with him, I assume. Uh, he said, I would immediately change our Dutch prime minister Rutte with your Victor Orban. What is, what is his secret? Why is he appealing to many people in different countries, Viktor Orban? Very flattering uh, from a Dutch colleague. I think what is being admired uh, from outside, it's somewhat different from within, but within Hungary, is that he has leadership qualities. That's to say, he is saying things and doing things which very few other prime ministers or leaders are prepared to do. He takes risks. If you compare his style to that of, let's say, Angela Merkel, Angela Merkel is unquestionably far more powerful leader. Germany is a much more important country than Hungary, let's be quite clear about it. She's immensely cautious and she takes decisions only when they're absolutely necessary. The one time she took a risk last summer over this Will Commons culture, it exploded in her face. Orban, I think, is, is a skillful politician. My view of him is that he has that unusual quality. Uh, he, is, he doesn't just have leadership, he has charisma. Uh, he, he attracts people, and by the way, by the same token, he repels people. I mean, it goes both ways. Um, but the people whom he attracts are fascinated by him. I've watched him with big crowds, informal meetings, formal meetings. He engages people and people feel that he, he talks directly to them. He doesn't use bureaucratic language. He doesn't use technocratic language. He talks the language that people understand, not invariably, but for the most part. So in that sense, He really does stand out from the current generation of European Prime Ministers who, let's be honest about this, are not very exciting. He provides a kind of political excitement that you know, even when you disagree with him, you know you're going to be engaging with something different. And I think for many people in Europe, especially given the general situation, which is very difficult uh, to see a way out of, He is a potential leader who says, okay, I'm doing something, follow me, because it may be the solution, or as far as I'm concerned, it is the solution. There are a number of reasons why uh, he's getting 80% support from Hungarian opinion. One is that we simply can't see ourselves um, as being able to live with a huge number of non-European migrants. We've only just come out of communism. It's only 25 years. The political situation in Hungary is deeply divided. Um, we are constantly under attack by the Western media. I think the German media are in the forefront. And here's a wonderful paradox. They say, you're not doing enough. You're a terrible, backward, reactionary, undemocratic country. And they want refugees to come to a backward, reactionary, undemocratic country. I mean, it's bizarre. Secondly, as a deeper level proposition, is that if a country wants to be multicultural, that's fine. It's a matter of choice. If a country doesn't want to be multicultural, that's also a matter of choice. And the overwhelming view in Hungary is we've looked at, however deeply, however superficially, at what multiculturalism has achieved, attained, brought about in Germany, in France, in Britain, the British situation, is the one I know best. We don't want it. And there's a third issue. It's expensive. Um, I think in Germany, a uh, refugee gets 35 euros a day. Now that exceeds the salary of quite a lot of Hungarians. We simply can't afford to take on large numbers of people. And as best as I can make out, the Commission is saying not a penny. So what are we going to do? Uh, I mean, the whole thing is an absurdity. Um, And then, I suppose the fourth is that 
it gets a bit technical. Schengen Frontier Dublin regulations. Um, Hungary's position was we will obey the Dublin regulations, we will protect Schengen. We have this external Schengen border with Serbia, as a matter of fact, also Romania and Ukraine, which are at the moment are relatively okay. Um, and then we get, um, I'll try and find a polite word, uh, miserably attacked by the Western media about how cruel the Hungarians are. I don't know if you went to the Hungarian-Serbian border yourself, but it's always a razor wire fence. And if you recall, all the photographs were of women and children. Actually, 75%, 80% of those who came were fit young men. Somehow, the Western media screened this out. So there are grounds for resentment. And I think the whole thing adds up to a position saying, no, um, we don't want this. We want to have Hungary the way we have it. If we get refugees who register and they want to stay in Hungary, and the thing the case is genuine, we take them on. We've taken on a few hundred. Um, they have, they have to, but they are learning Hungarian. That's quite a task, but it's not impossible. I've met people who have learned Hungarian as adults, but it's a question of how much choice, how much autonomy does a member state of the European Union have? Where does sovereignty end? Where do the powers of the Commission end? And in a way, that's the contest we're in at the moment. It's sort of special, I'm, I'm looking for the word, also a little bit sad maybe, you tell me. If I go to someone in South America or go to someone in the United States or in Canada and I ask them, make a list of five real European countries. They will say France, they will say Germany. With a little luck, I find someone who mentions Holland. Hungary will very rarely be on that list. And you're fighting more for Western culture and European identity than maybe any other country with Viktor Orban. Um, I don't know if the name of Czesław Miłosz means anything to you. He was a Polish poet. He actually came from what is now Lithuania, uh, from Vilnius, uh, Vilno. Um, he wrote somewhere that you have a better perspective on Europe from the edge. Uh, it's rather a nice idea. So, you know, he coming from the eastern end of Europe uh, sees on the whole of Europe. So, in a sense, Hungary is in this position. We see ourselves as having been a part of Europe for 2,000 years. Um, sometimes we are recognized as a significant actor. Latterly, we're not. Well, that's to do with things like the First World War. We ended up on the losing side. Things like the Second World War, we ended up on the losing side. In fact, actually, Hungary ended up on the losing side in every war until the Gulf War uh, in 1990. Well, great Hungarian success. I think we were present with about 35 people. Well, you know, a victory is a victory, even if, you know, it's not a really big one. Um, I think also for me, and not just me, obviously, um, the communist period. The communist period, of course, was very long. It was 45 years. Uh, and it, it really did mean that Hungary was compressed into this Soviet bloc. People couldn't see it. And then there is this, certainly this sense in Hungary, we must put ourselves on the map somehow. Every time a Hungarian does something outside Hungary, we think, oh, how wonderful. Um, when Imre Kertész got the Nobel Prize for Literature, yes, that was quite important. You may know the name of Sándor Márai. Uh, he wrote the book called, well, it's called Kluden in Dutch, Embers, uh, Gluten in German, Embers in English. It's a very different name in Hungarian. And everyone thought, oh yeah, wonderful, yes, you know, if, if we're home at last. Little realizing that actually the competition in the cultural literary field or musical field or whatever is so enormous that we might have a five minute success or possibly even 15 minutes of fame, but not actually lasting. And I, one other factor here, that doesn't just apply to Hungary, it applies to all the Central European states. We are cut off by language. If I say something in Hungarian, nobody will hear it. If I say it in English, they will. Actually, it was a Dutch journalist, uh, Loris Leyendijk, I'm sure you know his name, um, who wrote somewhere, if the second coming were to be announced in Dutch, nobody would know about it. You don't have to do this, but it would be fun and maybe helpful if you, on camera, this is your camera, would tell Rutte and Merkel and, and their kind of 
politicians what the five main things are that they should implement from the Hungarian, the Viktor Orban perspective. And, and be polite, dear... Oh, but of course, um, dear Prime Ministers, I'm only a, a simple member of the European Parliament from Hungary. But from what I see, um, there are urgent issues in Europe. Uh, I think the, sing the single most important issue, that's the one I would start with, is start paying attention to Central Europe, including Hungary, or the Netherlands, or, or Poland, or the Czech Republic. We have things to say that will never occur to you, because we have a different historical experience. So listen to us. I think in this particular instance, as far as the migrant question is concerned, we were right. Hungary, that's to say, Orban. Um, he started saying this oh, roughly a year ago, and nobody really wanted to hear. But sadly for you, I'm not sure that you know, we should be crowing about this. I think that Hungary was right on this occasion. Um, what should be the third thing? Well, the third thing is much more a kind of uh, what, where does Europe go from here? Um, I think the broad approach of Hungary, and not just Hungary, is that we are in favour of European integration. We are not like the Brits, who may or may not be in favour, I'm thinking of Brexit. I think we want European integration to continue, but not necessarily in the way in which it is practised at the moment. We think much of it is dysfunctional. Um, the idea that the Commission can launch a programme without serious consultation is simply not acceptable. And I think you are also aware uh, that large numbers of European citizens disagree with what is coming out of Brussels. And this is my fourth point, don't dismiss it as populism. That's a very, very dangerous, to go, dangerous road to go down. Um, this is the point at which I like to quote the poem by Brecht who said, well, if you don't like it, why don't you dissolve the people and elect yourselves a new one? Now, nobody, he's referring to East Germany, East Berlin, 1953, of course. I used to be able to quote it in German, so I can't do it now. Um, but basically, um, people who disagree with the Commission, who disagree with what they think is the European Union, are not evil populists. They just have a different perspective of how Europe should go. Part of which, and this is maybe the fifth point, is European leaders have become very remote from the people. I'm not saying anything very new or exciting when I say there is a, a low-level anti-establishment insurrection taking place. Take note of that, because if you don't, then I think the entire European project will be in danger. You're not popular among people like Merkel and Rutte. Why are populists not popular among politicians? Well, the word populist is itself suspect. If we talk about citizens, that's fine. If we talk about populism, that's not fine. But it's the same people, the citizens of Europe, having a view. Um, well, obviously, uh, if the people, if society, if the citizens want something other than what the leaders want, they're not going to be popular. Uh, because leaders basically want to be able to say, this is what must, uh, must be done. Uh, or, uh, I think I should quote Mrs. Thatcher here, who used to say, Tina, there is no alternative, and she'd say it very loudly. And I think that many politicians like to say, well, this is what we must do. And then they suddenly discover that sizable sections of the population say, no, we won't. We want something else. And then they're populists. Well, the Viktor Orban line of thinking and, and closing borders, or at least not opening them, be common in Europe soon? Well, it's already started. I mean, I, I find Austria totally bizarre, which spent a lot of time last summer saying how terrible Hungary is because of building this fence. Now they're building fences. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, they build a gate with wings. Now, I mean, uh, you could twist the language only so far. The Macedonians, not an EU country, have built a fence. Um, and of course, there's a much longer established fence between Spain and its enclaves in Morocco. There's a Calais story. So there's nothing new in this. Uh, Schengen frontiers clearly have to be protected. That's the Hungarian position. 
if others are building, and actually, yes, in the Baltic states, they're thinking of, they're planning to build fences on the Baltic-Russian border. So sometimes it's essential. Uh, I don't think anybody in Hungary is happy about this because it's expensive apart from anything else and regrettable and I don't think the Serbs like it either and we have very good relations with Serbia, but it's had to, it had to be done. Is Europe implementing the Hungarian solutions? Oh, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I'm sure that some of the solutions that some European countries are implementing have reluctantly turned to looked at Hungary. Uh, but I haven't yet heard a single European leader say what a good idea Orban had to build those fences. No, that's not happening. Uh, but, well, you know, um, success has many fathers. Thank you.